You're now listening to Artprize Talks. I'm your host, Katie Booth, and every fortnight we'll be talking to another changemaker who's rejected the status quo of a corporate nine to five and is instead making their own path in life. We're here talking about the challenges, triumphs, and everything in between when it comes to the search for an entrepreneurial career that makes you feel truly alive. So let's get this show on the road. Cool. So without further ado, our next guest had his entrepreneurial epiphany while enjoying the sunshine at Lord's Cricket Ground a few years ago. All of a sudden, he gets an all too familiar sinking feeling. A terrible fear takes hold as he realized that while waiting for a crucial call about a final stage job interview, his phone was rapidly running out of battery. With no other option, he has to leave the cricket to run to a shop and splash out on a power pack. And thus the idea for Charged Up was born. Today, I'm very excited to talk to Charged Up co-founder and CEO, Hugo Tilmouth, who since then has grown the company from four co-founders to a team of over 30, become Europe's largest phone charging network with over two and a half thousand venue partners, been named in Forbes 30 under 30, and been back to the tune of around 1.5 million by the likes of Jam Jar and The Garage. Hello, Hugo. Hello, <laughs> it's very good to be chatting to you. That, that's, that's a very nice <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so my first question is, did you get the job? I didn't, but thank God I didn't, <laughs> honestly. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a great opportunity um, to, to join the grad scheme with Microsoft, um, doing all sorts of interesting things in technology. But, you know, thank God I didn't get the job because otherwise I'd probably be there now and not, not running charged up and having all of the fun that we get to do in, in the startup every day. Awesome. Yeah, I guess you kind of didn't need it after after that idea kind of hit you. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to first start by winding the clock back a little bit to before Charged Up. So I can kind of uh, see from, from my LinkedIn stalking um, that when you were kind of finishing up at school and university, um, you did a whole kind of ton of internships from finance at Deutsche Bank to design, technology at Google, engineering, venture capital. Um, why yeah. did you kind of make that decision to do a load of internships and how did that kind of exposure to so many different careers shape your, you know, your, your future choices? Yeah, sure. So I guess going through, you know, really from when I was like age 15, um, I just started doing internships as many as I could kind of figure my way into, uh, whether, whether it was through like parents, friends, or, you know, reaching out to people through the school network or whatever, um, in order to get exposure to different types of industries. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do after school. Um, so, you know, I first started off by looking at architecture. I went into an architecture firm for, for a summer. Uh, I went into an engineering firm, to see if I enjoyed that. Unfortunately, neither of those were that interesting to me. Um, I then went in and did some um, work at Google. That was absolutely inspiring. Um, I, I thought, you know, the, the, uh, the office environment, the work environment, everything that the guys were working on at Google was just so interesting. And that kind of, I think that was the first thing that made me think maybe the kind of tech world is, is where I'm going to want to end up. Um, mm -hmm. I then worked at um, a large VC fund, um, uh, it was more kind of like a private equity fund, um, it, and they were, that, that was quite interesting. I started to get a, an understanding of how investment worked, and um, I, I made some good contacts there as well, which then led on to a much, much smaller, uh, much more early stage investment fund the next year, um, uh, and that was literally, I think there was four people in the company um, so I was doing, I was exposed to everything from, you know, sourcing deals to uh, speaking to the clients, um, speaking to the investors on the other side. Um, you know, obviously I wasn't really doing anything that meaningful as, a, as an intern, but I learned a great deal through that. Um, and it really made me have a, an interest in the investment side of, of um, startups and uh, funding kind of high growth businesses. Um, I then went and worked at a company called PaveGen. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, startup. Um, they, uh, there's, a, there's a guy from, uh, from the school that we both went to uh, who also went there 
and that's how I managed to get in uh, again using that that network um, and uh, a chap called Johnny Keeling really good guy he he, uh, he, he um, uh, could, uh, managed to introduce me to the CEO and then I managed to get a summer's placement there which was fantastic I, I really learned um, everything from you know production to um, doing installs to figuring out uh, operations um, systems there were so many different things I was exposed to there and at the same time they were going through a massive fundraising campaign on Crowdcube um, and and then yeah I, I just really that was the moment when I thought you know startups are really the place I want to be um, and off the back of that uh, I, I went back to university for a year uh, I was completing my master's at Exeter University in renewable energy engineering um, and off the back of that, uh, you know, we're, we're at Lord's Cricket Ground, uh, where you started your story. Uh, I was enjoying, enjoying the sun and I'd been applying to every single, um, uh, like placement or, um, grad scheme that I could get my hands on. Um, and luckily, uh, I had this, uh, brilliant idea for, for Charged Up, uh, and ended up kind of pursuing that. Wow. That's, um, yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting that you kind of tried so many, so many different things. Um, yeah. And obviously while you were still quite young as well, so you kind of, you know, while you were at school at, at university, you kind of, you know, using that spare time to actually figure out what you want to do. Because it's quite a scary thing when you're like coming to the end of school or you're kind of at university, you're like, oh my God, I've got to decide what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think having that, you know, obviously having that exposure to different things meant that you could rule certain things out and, and figure out what what's actually kind of interesting to you I guess oh, on a kind of on a on a practical level like how did you kind of go about getting those internships and stuff you know you're kind of talking a lot about you know utilizing personal networks and, and stuff like that yeah um you know I it's it's an unfortunate thing of how it works but you know it the, the easiest way to get a job uh or at least an internship is to to go through whether it's the parents friends or friends of friends or uh you know networks that that you kind of have access to because it gives you that layer that level of trust when you're coming in as a you know a 16 year old kid who who's asking for a for an internship um but i did have some success uh, reaching out directly as well uh you know with completely cold um mm. and that's how i got uh the the, the job at the at the vc um, so, so like, obviously it is better to, to try and go through a, a warm introduction. Um, but obviously not everyone has access to, to the, the networks, um, that we're very lucky to have. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely possible to do it cold as well, but, uh, I, I found it much better to go through a warm introduction. Yeah. Just got to be, uh, it's kind of like getting over that kind of fear of people saying no and just putting yourself out there. You've just kind of got to go for it really. Yeah, like, uh, to be honest, it, to, to get just like a week in somewhere, you know, I, I'm, I'm always surprised at the, 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 the kind of tiny number of people that actually apply to do that at, at Charged Up. You know, we, we've taken on interns for like the period of a year or even just like a period of two weeks, um, you know, over the last three years. And we're always happy to have them. Um, but I think people are just scared to apply or think that they won't get it or whatever. Um, but the, the, the people who do apply, you know, they're generally met with a, a good reception um, and you know we're always happy to to kind of expose people to to the industry and kind of help them get that leg up because that, that's how you know I, I was able to um, you know advance uh, through what I wanted to do in life and then eventually to give me the experience that was able it allowed me to start the business that I'm doing now um, was because of the kindness of people who were like, yeah, we'll give this, you know, stupid little child uh, uh, <laughs> a, uh, an opportunity to come in and learn from us for a few weeks. And, um, you know, I, I want to repay that uh, to the, I guess, the next, the next cohort that come through. Yeah. And I guess you always need the extra pair of hands in a startup, right? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah when we've got <laughs> so many things going on, it's, it's always useful to have a few extra pairs of hands. <laughs> cool so uh the other thing i kind of wanted to touch on was as well as kind of obviously going through this experience of doing loads of internships and stuff like that um you also started an events and djing company while you're at uni if i'm right so yeah, well, i mean what did you what did you kind of learn from from that experience yeah it was really good um at, at university i started with a 
a couple of friends uh, a business called Immersion Events. Um, it was all about creating an immersive experience when you go out. So it's not just a typical club night. You know, we do something a little bit more than that. Um, we, we we had a great deal of fun doing it, but it ultimately ended up being quite a quite, quite a successful little business. You know, in the scale of a university, at least. Um, you know, we we had a a weekly night at, at a local local venue. Um, we were doing these one-off events, probably uh, once every every three months or so. That would be a real blowout. And then also we ended up running events for lots of the societies. And then off the back of that, we ended up setting up a a, a kind of rental business as well. So like renting out equipment to people. Um, and again, it was all just you know it was figuring stuff out, seeing what the demand was, and and then creating um, I guess products off the back of that. Um, but it ended up you know really paying quite nicely as as a university student with no money. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it allowed me to have a little bit more money in the back pocket. Um, but I think ultimately it, it taught me a great deal as well. You know, I I was at one point we had a team of probably about fifteen promo staff. So you know, learning how to um, you know, put out a job post and then, you know, do interviews with people and then sorting through and then managing a team um, and then, you know, hiring photographers and DJs and then, you know, DJs not turning up on the night and then having to figure out how to get someone in or, you know, equipment breaking when you've got a show in like an hour and then you have to figure out how to get uh, another piece of equipment in. It was, it was all like a lot of, it was great fun, but, you know, what it did actually teach, um, you know, me an, an awful lot about how to, run a, a kind of micro business um and you know you, you you learn how to how to run the books on on a business and how to uh you know we we, we never obviously didn't take any investment into that business so how to figure out how to make the cash flow work so yeah. you know, paying after the event for for as many things as possible you know it's all, all of this good stuff um and i've recommended to many, many people that I know who are kind of at university at the moment, um, you know, uh, that, that, you know, an events business, it, they're always going to come and go, you know, as the people move through the ranks at university, you know, the business is no longer obviously at my university anymore. As soon as I left it, it kind of, it disappeared. But, um, you know, starting that, there's always going to be demand for it. You know, uni students like to go out and party. So um, it's a great <laughs> business to kind of, um, get get your teeth into and and learn as you go along and and what's the worst that can happen is is the the, the parties don't work out and then you know what well, it, it's not that it's not that big a deal really yeah that was really interesting so I guess a couple of questions is so one how I mean okay mo most people think of university students as you know you go you probably attend the bare minimum of lectures, you do the bare minimum work to, you get your 40% so you can get into the next year, you go out, you have a great time. So actually it, it takes kind of probably quite a special kind of university student to be like, oh actually I'm gonna set up a business and do it like that's very kind of, well, that's to be honest. not what I would call your average student. So like where does this, where do you <laughs> think this kind of entrepreneurial, uh, I don't know, kind of instinct comes from, do you think? I think I think it's it's nothing it's nothing that special. I just get I, I basically I can't learn from lectures at all. That's why I I, I really struggled at uh, you know at school to to kind of concentrate in in class and, and and at university especially when there's like zero interactivity. You know you're just being talked at with a with a slide deck for for two hours. Like I would end up just setting up you know websites businesses on my laptop in those lectures rather than listening to the to the to the lecturer. <laughs> Um, so I think it was it was partly out of um, out of boredom um, that you know I had to attend those lectures and yet I just I couldn't take in the information I'd end up having to you know read through the slides or watch the recording later um, and it so yeah I ended up just doing working away in in those lecture halls um, and you know setting up multiple different ventures um, you know uh, while while sat in the lecture hall it was pretty funny. <laughs> it's um yeah it's kind of like a, a good good way to be rebellious i suppose I um, <laughs> <laughs> just, just for uh for, for credit i did actually manage to get through university with a 2-1 so i, I was okay in the end <laughs> <laughs> well clearly clearly <laughs> um i think that the second thing that you said that was quite interesting was kind of like you know that having that attitude of like oh well, what's the worst that can happen like oh well okay an event doesn't go to plan but big deal i think a lot of people you know have a really big fear of failure and actually we're doing um we're doing a workshop tomorrow, in fact, about kind of 
changing someone's mindset around failure like do you think how is that something that you found kind of helps you quite a lot 100 percent, yeah like it was it was the way i kind of justified um you know not going into a normal job and just cracking on with charged up when you know like for context we we did a year with with no salaries at all for, for charged up but you know i'd saved some money from the events business from some other bits yeah. and pieces i've been working on um at university but um you know i was i was living with the parents it was it, you know commuting into london for literally i was spending five hours on the train every day to get into town um you know trying to dodge ticket fares so that i didn't have to pay the full rate every day <laughs> all of this madness um you know it was it was all quite strange in the early days but um, you know, I, I, I think um, what's like you, you always have to think what is the worst that can happen? And obviously, as you move through life and, you know, you get more dependencies on you, whether you have a mortgage or you have children or what have you, it, it does become more difficult to kind of just go for it. But the way I always thought about it, especially when I was, you know, just coming straight out of university is what's the absolute worst that can happen? You know, I, I'm going to have to go move back in with mum and dad. You know, they'd be they'd be probably happy to have me back. And, <laughs> <laughs> um and and like you know the I, i'm kind of starting with with not very much um so so you know what what's the worst that can really happen out of this um and i think it's it's that like optimistic mindset that really is is the way to to kind of go about life and if, if you want to do something a little bit more risky um you have to be very optimistic otherwise it's it's going to be quite difficult to convince yourself to do it um because there's you can always do it next weekend or you can always do it next month or next year um, but sometimes you just have to give it a crack and and go for it. And you know, especially as someone straight out of university, it, it didn't matter if if it went wrong. You know, yeah, I could, I could just go <laughs> in a normal job like everyone else. Yeah, um, in a years 100%. time or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, so that's like something we talk about quite a lot at Uprise Academy is um, take taking action. So like the the thing that really differentiates people that obviously do things and people that kind of just talk about them and have ideas is that, you know, it's great to have ideas, but actually it doesn't matter if you don't go and take action on it. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't believe but, the number of people that have said to me that they had the idea for Charged Up, you know, yeah. throughout the year. <laughs> and it's like, great, but you didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so like what, so you, talk me through that process. So like you have, you're sat at Law's Cricket Ground, you have this idea, you have the epiphany moment, what's yeah. like what are the next like i don't know three five steps that you're like right this is i've got an idea what are the next steps yeah sure so um after it, you know the the podcast story of how how charged up came about <laughs> is quite like a condensed version of of the truth um but you know yeah. the the situation did happen i i was at law's cricket ground phone ran out of charge ended up having to buy this power bank um i i i thought you know this is madness um it was probably six months or so later um, that I was I was basically um, working on a project at, at university. It was it was one of our um, thesis projects actually. It was a group project, and we were uh, making uh, basically a product out of solar panels. So we had to make solar panels from scratch um, and then wire it into something that would do something. And we came up with this idea for a solar charging station for mobile phones. Um, and it was out of the back of this idea of, you know, we, we literally built this unit, university loved it, um, they wanted to, to buy these units to put all around campus. Um, and I was, I was just thinking one day, like, what, you know, the, the problem with this is that your phone is locked away in a locker, um, you know, it, it's really not an ideal solution um, for, for charging your phone on the go. You can't actually use your phone while it's charging, it's not safe if you want to walk off. All of these things and that was kind of the only thing that existed in the market at the time mm. uh, and it was off the back of that that i had this idea of you know what what if you could take that power with you um and that's where the the whole thing kind of stemmed from so although the lord story is true <laughs> there, was, there was a bit of a, a process between that and actually kind of kicking off the business. <laughs> um, but it's nice you know it's nice and snappy for pr and whatever um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so so I guess the first stages after having that idea were literally just get on Google, you know, looking up what exists. Oh, have, has this already been done? Because unfortunately, most good ideas have already been done by someone else in some form. So, um, you know, if you, if you are truly bringing something brand new to the market, it is quite rare. Um, so, so, yeah, getting on Google, figuring out how, how to build it. 
Um, you know, obviously, I, I just spent four years studying engineering, so I could actually start building stuff myself. Um, you know, we we managed to we applied for some money from the university. I think we got four grand from the university. Um, Exeter has a, a brilliant program for supporting people who are wanting to start their own businesses. There's no equity involved. It's literally just a grant of, you know, come to us with your business plan. We'll give you some money and you can kind of go off and, and try it, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And I think that's open to people who've, you know, graduated years ago as well. So any of the extra network listening can, can tap into that. Um, and then um, off the back of that, we actually went and we basically tried to come up with like, what's the most MVP, you know, uh, minimum viable product format of our, of our um, you know, charging system that you could possibly come up with. And, you know, because it's such a simple business, it's actually quite easy to boil down. Um, so what we did was bought about probably two, 300 batteries, um, you know, from China, uh, got them branded up as charged up, um, got them all with unique IDs on them, um, and then took it to a festival. Um, nice. So we, we had like a little card machine, uh, an iZettle card machine that probably cost us 30 quid or something. Um, and then uh, a little system that we, we built using like Google Forms. And, you know, it was all super basic stuff, nothing that like anyone else couldn't do. You know, there was no technical skill that went into it. Um, and then literally we were there in the pouring rain at this festival, giving out these batteries, getting people to tap their card on it or give us a, a 10 pound deposit. And then if they brought the battery back, we'd refund them for the amount of kind of time that they borrowed the battery for. Um, and it was a very, very kind of simple version of what the business was. You know, it, it proved that people were wanting to charge their phones when they're out and about. It proved that people were willing to pay for it. Um, it allowed us, we did it over, I think, three or four days. So we were able to test different price points over those different days. Um, and ultimately, off the back of that, I think we made about, you know, two or three thousand pounds from, from doing that. And obviously, you know, it's a great amount of money, but there was a lot of time and effort that went into it. We were sat in a field getting soaked and it, was, it, was, it wasn't the most pleasant way to spend your time. And my, my mindset is always, how can we automate you know, all of these things. So that's where we obviously came, that's where the business started, but the, the, the vision was always to build something that could be left in the field, you know, whether, whether it's at a festival or um, in a venue, which is obviously where we kind of ended up landing on um, mm -hmm. as being our best use case. But it, it, it didn't require a person to be there renting out every single one, taking them back. Because firstly, that's costly. Secondly, it's not a very fun job for someone to be doing and it's not very scalable. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, we basically started building a vending machine. Um, so we, we were literally doing it in CAD. We, we bought, we, we won actually, uh, after, the, after doing that festival, we managed to win um, a competition with Shell Livewire, which supports kind of, um, green entrepreneurs doing something uh, good for the planet um, and and also I think it may also be a criteria that you're like under 30 or something as well um, but we we applied for that um, and managed to win it we got five grand off the back of that um, and then started you know we bought um, uh, like 3d printers um, and and the software to be able to actually produce the units and we started literally manufacturing them. We had, we had two 3D printers running 24 hours a day, producing these units, you know, the prototypes, mm -hmm. testing it all. And we were just building everything ourselves. Like it was very, um, you know, very hardcore uh, in terms of the, um, the engineering that we were having to come up with, um, you know, writing all of the code, all of this. And, but like, you know, it wasn't something that I, I learned before. It was, you know, kind of just figuring it out as we went along. Um, and then um, off the back of that, we, I guess, uh, managed to win another award from O2 uh, for 10 grand, which allowed us to actually start kind of ramping things up a bit more seriously. We, we then ended up hiring some developers uh, who could actually start building the apps because, you know, I, I can't code. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, I, can make a, I can make a prototype, but not much else. Um, and yeah, off the back of that, we started really ramping up the business. And, nice. Uh, yeah, I guess that, that was the first first kind of stage. Yeah, that's, um, I think, also, so going back to the, um, you mentioned, you know, investment from, you know, Shell and, and having that, you know, for being sort of a clean, um, clean energy sort of purpose-driven company. Obviously, you've been in the kind of clean tech 
space for a little while. So, you, you know, Pave Gen's obviously a clean tech company. You studied, you know, your, that was what kind of your master's was in. What, um, what kind of sparked that interest in clean tech, do you think? And why, you know, why do you think that's kind of a, a path that you followed? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think, to be honest, it's just necessary to um, make things as green as possible. Like we, we have finite resources on the planet. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was true 10 years ago. It's, it's going to be true in 10 years time as well. We, we need to be pushing towards a more sustainable future. Otherwise, we, the, you know, the science is there. Like it, it's literally, it's so obvious. Anyone who doesn't get it now, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on um, <laughs> inside their head. Um, it, it's so obvious that we need to be doing something to to sort out the the, the problems with global warming and um, the use of fossil fuels and the uh, you know the, even the use of cars. Like it, the the difference that we've we've seen. I don't know if you're you're in London at the moment, but in central London, um, the like the air is just so much cleaner now that the car use has just gone down so much because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Like. There's all of these factors need to just need to be addressed. And so I think it was always going to be the part that I would take was something that was based on, you know, doing a small part to, to help with that, with that much bigger problem. And, you know, phone, everyone using phone charging that's powered by green energy is not going to change the world, but at least it's, at least it's doing something towards it rather than doing something against it. Um, and yeah, so that's why we, very early stages partnered uh, with a green energy provider so that we could offset all of the energy that's used in our network um, and ensure that, you know, at least if people charge their phone with us, um, it was adding to the green energy grid, uh, increasing the investment in wind turbine solar panels up and down the UK um, and, you know, allowing us to do a little tiny bit of good um, to, to kind of solve the, the, the climate crisis that we're in right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I like how you say it's kind of like you're just doing your, your very small part because I think a lot of, um, you know, entrepreneurs, maybe when they're thinking about what ideas they want to pursue, could maybe be like, oh, well, I, I, I know that I want to help solve climate change or um, social inequality or, you know, what, whatever, you know, the, those big kind of issues that we have in today's world. But they're, they're massive issues, right? Like they're, they're huge. Like how do you go out and solve climate change? Like that's just too that's too big but I think what's kind of interesting is how you've kind of almost you've got you know what your your skills and understanding are which is that kind of like engineering piece that's what you studied at, at university you've got kind of what the world needs which is some kind of clean energy green solutions and you're kind of marrying that up with then you know what you're you're interested in and somehow yeah. all three of those kind of pieces of the puzzle come together um yeah. to to yeah to do your your sort of one small part to, to help that that's exactly it like i think it, it's not that difficult even if you have a completely unrelated business it's, it's not that difficult to make that business you know a good company you know whether it's you go full on and be a, a b corp or um you know you you just offset the energy that you use there's there's so many different companies now that have set up to allow you to do that um and it I think it costs so little to do and it's so little effort if you set it up at the beginning um, that when you scale, you know, will actually start making a difference to things. Um, mm. and, and customers really like it as well. You know, you, you don't you don't want to forget the fact that um, companies like Bulb and uh, Ecotricity and Octopus have all been built off the fact that people want to select a company that is doing good. Um, you know, people choose Teslas not just because they're a better car, but because they're uh, an electric car that's good for the planet. You know, mm. there's 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 reason you have to build a good product as well don't get me wrong um but i i do think people do choose um you know a solution that is green over uh, a competitor even if it's slightly more expensive because they like to be doing you know their little piece as well um for by you know by making that product choice yeah yeah definitely i think like it's just good it's i think the world's changing so that you know companies these days just have like it's almost like it has to be a given that you know you're you're doing something you know for good as well yeah um, which yeah. is great um so on that note as well let's talk about um let's talk about cleaned up because obviously we're in the middle of uh, a global pandemic um which is bizarre um but here we are and you've obviously you know this has hit charged up as a business because you know all of your venue partners restaurants bars etc 
are all closed. Um, mm. So yeah, to, to tell me about kind of cleaned up and how how that kind of came to came to be. Yeah, sure. So it was um, I think the week of lockdown. So we I think we got locked down on the Saturday, and it was on the Monday that we. Um, the, the previous week, we'd sent everyone home to to work remotely because we thought this was incoming. We thought, you know, this is going to happen anyway, so let's get ahead of it. You know, the team were absolutely fantastic. They went from being a fully, you know, shortage-based uh, company, everyone coming in every single day, um, to literally overnight uh, setting up as a completely remote company. Um, we thought it might only last for for a week or so. Obviously, it didn't. You know, we're still there now. Um, but yeah, the team adapted super quickly, literally like overnight, basically. Um, so that was great. But um, it, that that next week, we were set to launch uh, our medium stations. We were calling them very creative name there. Um, but it was the it was between the, the large station and the small station, so we called it the medium station. <laughs> that was set to to go out um, to 150 different uh, locations. You know, we were going into um, train stations, airports. Um, we were going to shopping centres all up and down the UK. Um, we had this amazing kind of backlog of of customers that were going to take the product. Um, and obviously, as lockdown started to happen. Um, we were, we were thinking, you know, we literally can't be shipping these because by the time they've left our warehouse, they're going to be getting to the to the venues and then they're probably going to get turned away. So mm. we paused all of those um, launches that we were going to do and started figuring out, you know, how are we going to um, kind of make this work? So the first the first week or so of, you know, coronavirus, we, we were basically trying to shore up the company, make sure that we were okay. You know, so obviously we've just gone through uh, quite a large um, fundraise. Um, we just did uh, two million quid at the end of last year, um, and you oh, know, I missed that out of my intro. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we we did that, um, and that that obviously gave us the kind of a bit of buffer um, to be able to you know even without revenue uh, keep the company um, alive for for, yeah. for a while. Um, but we were kind of sorting all of those things out, making sure that we cut costs wherever possible and kind of prepared for, for, for the storm that was going to come and hit us. Um, so, so, yeah, lots of different measures that we took, um, you know, even ahead of the, the furloughing scheme that was, that was brought out. Um, and, yeah, that, that obviously gave a lot of comfort to the team um, that we were going to be OK. We, we, we obviously extended our runway far into next year because of those cost cuts. Um, yeah. And that that gave everyone in the team that that kind of sense that you know charged up is is actually doing something here to make sure that our jobs are secure um, and that you know we're not going to be out on the street in in two months time when the company runs out of money. Um, yeah. So that was obviously really really positive thing to to kind of be able to do at the beginning. And then off the back of that, you know, we 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 started thinking like how are we going to actually do something useful in all of this? Um, so we we created a because um, we're all remote, you know, we can't get in the same room with each other. We created a um, kind of a virtual whiteboard or whatever you want to call it, where people could just throw in any random ideas that they had. Um, and we were calling them COVID proof ideas. So it was like, you know, we had all sorts of great ideas. And some of them, you know, people have actually gone on and done subsequently, um, you know, the ones that we didn't manage to get to in time. Um, some of them we're, we're still working on now behind the scenes. Um, some good ideas going to be popping out of uh, charged up labs very soon. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it was basically just like what crazy ideas, you know, we've, we've got this fantastic team. We know how to build things. We know how to manufacture in the UK, in China. We understand supply chains. Um, you know, we, we have fantastic developers that can basically build anything um, that they can think of. Um, you know, we've got an amazing operations team that know how to make really slick processes, how to automate things, how to scale things up super quickly. Um, you know, we've got this absolutely fantastic team. Yeah, and let, let's not even forget about the sales team who can literally sell ice to the Eskimos. Those guys are amazing. Um, they, like, we have all of these resources. What can we do with all of those different people to be able to help with the, with the COVID crisis? Um, and, you know, we tried out, we started trying lots of different ideas. We split up, I think, into three different groups across the company, focused on these different ideas that we were going to, you know, give a shot, uh, give, give a go to. Um, and um, ultimately, the, the what we called the, the cleaned up project, which was kind of a joke name, to be honest, at the beginning. Um, and uh, we, we uh, that was basically just 
converting those 150 units that I was you know, talking about that we weren't able to, to ship, um, converting those into hand sanitizer stations. So we were buying prototype parts off of, off of Amazon, you know, literally just like figuring it out um, how you could convert those units to a uh, hand sanitizer um, station. You know, if you, if you look back on our LinkedIn, we've got a, a pretty fun little weekly vlog and you can see kind of the, literally like the behind the scenes of how this all came together. Um, and it literally came together in the space of like less than a week um, from, from the initial idea of let's make these stations into hand sanitizer units to a, like an actual prototype that people could see photos of, see videos of, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, off the back of that, uh, we started pitching that out to clients. We sold those first 150 within literally like three days. Um, and we were just like, this, this, is, this is actually quite an interesting idea here. Um, what if we can really ramp this up? And, you know, this, this demand is only going to go up. Um, so yeah. let's, let's, you know, actually see, see where we can get to with this. And it's been a, a bit of a whirlwind ever since. Yeah, yeah I bet. Do you, uh, I mean, what's, what's the plan for kind of, you know, we're starting to maybe ease out of lockdown now. I mean, I think, we're, I mean, no one really knows what's going on at the moment, to be honest. But, um, you know, there's going to come a point where, you know, bars and restaurants and stuff start opening again. But, I mean, do you think, do you think cleaned up is going to extend you know, as, as life begins to go back to whatever, you know, the kind of new, new normal is going to be, do you think yep. people are going to be um, more kind of hygiene conscious and, and, you know, that this could become, you know, an, a new arm of the business, so to speak? Yeah, that's, that's kind of the thing that we've been wrestling with for the last, I guess, I don't even know how long it's been now, I'm losing track of time, but the last month or two, however long this has been going on, um, it, it's, it, you know, is this something that we are firstly interested in enough to, to kind of keep running as things start to return to normal? Yeah. And secondly, is it going to be something that people keep using? And the answer to both of those, um, we've come to the conclusion that it's yes. Um, and and it, it's actually a really fantastic opportunity because not only is, is there a real need for this, um, but also the, we think this is going to continue for not just, you know, a few months but a few years actually and potentially this will be the requirement now going forward forever and you know the fact that you know our, our generation the, the even the generations above us um, you know had never seen this type of disruption to their lifestyle in their yeah. you know in your entire life the, like nothing has disrupted the way that we go about our our daily lives like this before um, and or even for such a prolonged period as well. So I think this is going to stick in people's minds as a real, um, you know, a real change in in how we operate in the you know in in the uh, in the world because you know hygiene and cleanliness um, are so important to stopping these kind of viruses from spreading. And you know we we may well I, I really hope that um, you know the guys in Oxford come up with the vaccine. Um, in the next few months and then that's scaled up massively and everyone gets the vaccine within, you know, it'd be great if it was this year, but who, who really knows when it's actually mm -hmm. going to be. Um, but even once that's happened, you know, there's probably going to be a COVID-20 or a 21 or whatever, you oh, know. God. <laughs> this is like, I don't, I don't like to think about it too much, but it is probably, if this can happen, it can happen again, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think we do need to, as a society, be a bit more sensible about how we prevent these things from spreading. Um, and, you know, like I said, it, it, this has affected us all so much. I don't think people are going to just accept that, you know, everyone just goes into the tube and it just becomes this absolute, like, you know, like a terrible zone of spreading diseases and viruses and what have you. Um, you know, people are going to, you know, require that there's a bit more control um and that we that we prevent these things um from happening again or at least try and stop the spread um so so yeah i think this is going to be with us for a long while um you know in terms of the team we've got about half of the team working on charged up and half the team working on cleaned up um with obviously the majority of the sales team on on cleaned up um and you know the 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 uh you know the tech guys the the operations team are very much readying for relaunch um, so there's, there's like definitely, you know, I guess, uh, a divide within the team as to what people are focusing on and, and where their time is being spent. But, um, you know, we're, we're very excited for the, for the pubs to come back and all of our, oh, God, tell me about it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That'd be a great day. Um, 
and, and you know we, we've also got you know um, stations out in Germany out in the Netherlands and they're seeing a return to normality much sooner than us um, you know especially in the Netherlands they're they're really kind of pushing ahead um, Germany as well actually they're you know they're reopening um, you know some some nightclubs but Berghain is actually back open already um, which seems crazy to me. I don't, I don't know how they think that that's sensible, but um, you know, it's, it is, it's good to see that things are starting to kind of come back to normal. So um, we, we've got a full kind of strategy for how to make sure that our, our, our batteries are um, clean and, and not spreading COVID and how we, we get ready for relaunch. So that's a lot of what the team has been working on um, the past month or so. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's been busy on both fronts. I can imagine. And how do you, obviously this has been a major kind of, you know, entrepreneurship is full of kind of, you know, very high highs, but also very low lows as well and very difficult times. And obviously this has been a very difficult time for, for a lot of people. So how, I mean, how do you as a founder kind of almost mentally cope with those really, really difficult, you know, and, and low times? Yeah, no, it's like it was very tough going through that process of, um, you know, the, the, the cost cutting in the business, although we didn't have to let anyone go, you know, we had to reduce some salaries across, you know, the, the, the whole company. And, you know, those kind of decisions are really tough to make. Um, but, uh, and like it is, it's very stressful, but I'm, I'm very lucky in that I've got um, an amazing group of people that I work with in the team. You know, they're incredibly supportive. They believe in, you know, the mission that we're driving towards. Um, and, you know, I also have a great group of investors and advisors um, who I can call up and be very candid with and explain what, are, you know, what we're going through. And, you know, it, that, that really does help in terms of the kind of uh, mental support, I guess, um, of all of the stress. But, you know, it, it's, it's really when, when everything kind of settles down, you know, when it's like a, a Saturday morning or whatever, and everything is, you know, all the shits are hitting the fan. Um, that's when it's like, oh my God, what are we going to do to sort all of this out? But like, I think that's what, you know, makes you, it drives you to go faster and, 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 you know, work harder to solve the problems. Um, and, you know, I'm just really glad that we've got this project with cleaned up that allows everyone to put their mental energy into something that's positive, that's doing something good for um, stopping the spread of COVID, you know, making sure that we can support all of our venue partners as they start to reopen. Um, but it's also, you know, it, th there's a huge opportunity. So the guys are very, very busy. We're, we're dispatching thousands of units every week. Um, so it is, you know, it's something that is actually like beneficial to the company as well, rather than it just mm. being like a nice project to do that keeps people busy. It, it, it works as well for, you know, keeping us afloat as a business. Yeah, you've got to kind of, I guess the only thing you can do is really take action. And, you know, especially as a startup where sometimes, you know, these say there's, you know, it's almost life or death situations for a business, you know, you have to, you have to adapt and, and you have to change and, you know, having that openness to, to change is, is I think quite important. Yeah, no, I just, I just kind of, um, you know, I think back to how different the company was when we were, you know, the four guys um, with, with very, very little runway, um, you know, in terms of if, if certain invoices didn't come in or if certain deals didn't get done, you know, we would have been out of cash in, you know, a matter of months. Um, and the fact that we're now in this position, I'm so grateful for, you know, COVID not coming two years previously, because that probably <laughs> yeah. would have wiped us out. Um, or at least we would have had to figure out some other way of, of getting through this, this crisis. But, um, you know, we, we, we're going to be okay through this now, which is very nice to see. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really down to the great work of the team and in, in figuring out how to, to kind of pivot and make something happen. Yeah, no, definitely. It's been amazing to kind of follow it all on LinkedIn and stuff like that. So I think, yeah, it's, um, it's awesome to see. Um, so, and uh, finally, what, um, what kind of advice would you give to someone who maybe has got an idea, they've had their Lord's Cricket Ground aha moment, um, but they don't really know what to do next? What would kind of be your advice? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not going to lie. I do get asked this quite a lot. Um, <laughs> some reason think I know know what I'm doing I really don't I think that's the, <laughs> that's the that's the big thing to remember is that everyone's kind of just figuring it out as they go along um but yeah, yeah my, my advice would be just give it a crack you know figure out what that you know renting batteries in a field um you know method is for proving out your business and just give it a go like wh what is the worst that can happen 
um, you know, you, you, you may end up running a business that you really enjoy um, and, you know, is, is, you, you're absolutely passionate about. Um, and it may end up, you know, at some, some point making you really rich and that, that would be fantastic. But even if it doesn't, you know, at least you've given it a try um, and at least you, you've not like had that regret of not doing it. Um, so I just think go for it. Read, read the, um, the Eric Reese um, Lean Business Model Canvas or whatever that book's called. It's brilliant. Like that, that was how we figured out how to do the MVP model for, for Charged Up. Um, and it, yeah, that, that's really the, the, the advice I would have is just give it a crack. Nice. Build an MVP <laughs> and give it a crack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Well, on that note, um, yeah, thank you so much, Hugo, for your, your time and words of wisdom. Um, um, yeah, I'm very interested to see kind of what happens to Charged Up slash and or Cleaned Up, um, you know, obviously as, as time goes on. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Katie. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Every fortnight, we'll be talking to the world's changemakers about all the highs and lows of entrepreneurship and giving you the insights to help you on your journey. If you want to hear more, make sure you hit subscribe and if you'd like to know more about how we help driven people pursue meaningful entrepreneurial careers, head over to our website, www.uprise.academy or follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram at Uprise Academy. We'll see you in the next episode.